If I told him, if I told him, if Napoleon, would he like it? If I told him, would he like it? If I told him, would he like it? If I told him. That's the first stanza to my word portrait of my dear friend Pablo Picasso. Sometimes when I would read my poetry, Pablo would jump up and say, Gertrude, please stop. I can only stand so much abstraction. <laughs> and he wasn't the only one that felt that way. <laughs> but that was during my rebirth in Paris. My first birth was in 1874 in Pennsylvania into a German Jewish immigrant family. My father, however, soon took us back to Europe, where apparently as a toddler I fell in love with France. But then he brought us back to the United States, to California, to the Bay Area, seeking his fortune, which happily he found. So as a child, I wanted for very little, and I was given a great deal of freedom. My brother Leo and I spent most of our time wandering around the Bay Area, and when I wasn't wandering around the Bay Area, I was reading. In fact, I read so much that at one point I panicked because I thought I was going to run out of things to read. That didn't happen, I'm happy to say. Um, I don't know if it was the freedom that I had or some sort of teenage angst, but uh, I dropped out of high school. So you are looking at a high school dropout. <laughs> Nevertheless, I ended up being admitted to Ratcliffe, which was then known as the Harvard Annex, that will tell you something about the relationship of women to men at that time. We were annexes to men at Harvard. Um, but I did meet there one of the most important mentors of my life, William James, philosopher and psychologist. And under his tutelage, I did experiments in automatic, automi automatic writing. Uh, and I learned of his theory of the continuous present. Probably the simplest aspect of that is simply that we are always in the continuous present that that is all that exists. The past does not exist. The past only exists in the continuous present, as does the future. And that probably accounts for my saying that narration need not have a beginning or middle and end. Also, perhaps, accounts for the spiraling, repetitive nature of some of my prose. I move very slowly through the continuous present in a lot of my prose. The one thing that William James was wrong about, though, was in recommending that I enter the field of medicine and go to John Hopkins University to do that. That was one of the most aggravating experiences of my life. <laughs> Women were not welcome there, particularly. And in addition to that, I found it extremely boring, and I do hate to be bored. So guess what I did? I dropped out <laughs> again. But that worked out very well because it allowed me to follow my brothers Michael and Leo to Europe where we settled in Paris, lived off the family fortune, and began to buy the artworks of the people that were changing the world of art. People like Cezanne, and Matisse, and Picasso, and Juan Grieg. And in addition to that, they inspired me to want to try to do to literature, to writing, what they had done to painting, to try to change the nature of words as they had changed the nature of objects, to change the nature of writing as they had changed the nature of painting. So I, I was focused on my writing, but we also continued to collect the artwork, and eventually our apartment at 27 Rue de Fleurieu in Paris was filled from floor to ceiling with these magnificent works of art. And it caused so much excitement that we attracted intellectuals from all over the world to our Saturday night salons. Um, all kinds of intellectuals, even musicians such as Virgil Thomas, who or Thompson, who actually was from Kansas City near here, and whom I, with whom I collaborated on two of my operas, Four Saints and Three Acts, and also The Mother of Them All, which was about Susan B. Anthony. Uh, in addition to that, all kinds of writers came to our salons and came to me for mentoring and advice. People like Ernest Hemingway, Sherwood Anderson, Thornton Wilder, even F. Scott Fitzgerald came to me for advice. Uh, the poet Apollinaire from Paris came to me as well. And in addition to that, of course, the, the, the artists came themselves to see exactly where they were positioned on the wall and who was above or below them and what their competition was doing. And a lot of young, new, rising artists came to me for advice and promotion. So it was a very interesting time. It also attracted, however, 
a young lady by the name of Alice B. Toklas, my precious baby, who was my wife for 36 years. Some people would say I was ahead of my time in that regard, <laughs> but uh, some people would say I was ahead of my time in almost every regard. But you know, actually, I don't think the people are ever ahead of their time. I think their contemporaries just fall behind them. I know a lot of times I was standing there saying, well, here I am, where is everybody else? <clears throat> but um, Alice added a great deal of domestic tranquility to my life, which was much needed, and she was a wonderful advocate for me with publishers. Uh, despite that fact, though, I ended up having to finance most of my publications, certainly most of my early publications. So if there are any writers out here in the audience who are having to self-publish, let that be some solace to you. Most of mine were self-published. Until, until I wrote the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. And I managed to capture her manner of speaking and our lives, her life and our lives together was sort of my autobiography in some respects. But I basically broke the mold on autobiographies as I had broken the mold on so many other things. And it seemed to capture the world's imagination. And suddenly I became a celebrity. And for the first time in 58 years, I earned my own money. 58 years. <laughs> so that was an adjustment for me, but I managed to adjust, partially because those much maligned works that nobody would publish before suddenly became publishable. So that was a good thing. And I, um, and one of those actually was called Tender Buttons. You may have heard of it. it uh, today, probably, a lot of them would be called prose poems. And I thought I would share a couple of those with you tonight. The first one is called The White Hunter. The White Hunter is nearly crazy. That's it. <laughs> and I think it still applies today, actually. It holds up well. <laughs> this, this next one is called Breakfast. A change, a final change includes potatoes. This is no authority for the abuse of cheese. How, what language can instruct any fellow? A shining breakfast, a breakfast shining, no dispute, no practice, nothing, nothing at all. A sudden slice changes the whole plate. It does so suddenly. And I shall change the plate of literature. But first, I must walk my dog. Come on, basket. Let's go to the park. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. Well, so I was sitting here reading my paper, as I like to do. And all of a sudden, over here at the edge of the park, there was a lot of commotion. And I looked over, and there was this young black woman there. And she was dressed, from my point of view, at the turn of the century, kind of bizarrely. I, I'd never seen anything like it before. They tell me now it was a dashiki, but I had never seen that before. And she was carrying a sign saying equal rights, which I had seen before. But, and then I realized that she was making a speech and talking some about her life and what brought her to this point today. And I remember she said that she was born in 1936. That caught my attention because I thought, well, I died in 1946, so that seemed kind of strange. But uh, <laughs> there she was. And she also was born into an immigrant family. I believe her parents were Jamaican immigrants, and her... Uh, her mother was, was a nurse, and her father was a postal worker. And it seemed as if her father was the important figure in her life. He was actually very harsh towards her, almost brutal. And I think she indicated that he beat her on a regular basis. Um, but on the other hand, he was a very positive influence in her life because he pushed her to read constantly, which she did, just as I did. And I remember her saying that she wrote her first poem at age seven. That caught my attention because I began writing Shakespearean plays at age eight. So we had that in common. And uh, she also said that her father told her that there was a war on black people 
and that she was to be a soldier in that war, that that basically was what he was grooming her for. And that, I guess, was what had brought her, or one of the many things that had brought her here today to protest for equal rights. But as she was talking, suddenly there was a lot of shouting and people started running and, and she ran over here and sat right here, put the sign behind the bench, and I proceeded to pretend to still be reading. And she started reading over my shoulder and she said, uh, oh, I see the suffragettes are at it again. And I said, well, yes, I find that interesting. Uh, in fact, I'm a writer and someday I will write an opera about Susan B. Anthony. But you know, and it's not that I have anything against the cause of women or any other cause for that matter, but it simply is not my business. And I think it's important to know what's not your business. Well, she was astounded by that. She said, not your business? How could that not be your business? Women's rights and their, the need for women to have the vote. She said, anything that, that involves people who need equal rights is my business. And I said, well, I, and she said, I don't see how you can be blind to the plight of others. And I told her that I was not blind to the plight of others, and I didn't want her to think that. And as evidence of that, I read her this one poem that I wrote called The Long Dress. What is the current that makes machinery, that makes it crackle? What is the current that presents a long line and a necessary waste? What is this current? What is the wind? What is it? Well, I know what the current is. I know what the wind is. The current that makes machinery crackles are workers. I understand that. And in this instance, it's women workers. All of that I understand, and I know that oftentimes they are not treated fairly. What I'm saying is that I don't consider it my business because my business is a writer, and I have a sort of a male genius. That was definitely the wrong thing to say. <laughs> Male genius, she said. What could you mean by that? Are you saying that women don't, can't be geniuses? And I said, no, no. I'm just saying that I am not going to be confined by my gender nor defined by my gender. I have this one absorbing occupation. I'm going to accomplish certain things within that. And right now, it seems to me that men are the ones accomplishing things. And, and as I said, I have a kind of male point of view. And she said that she had a female point of view, as well as a point of view that was pushing for anybody who was suffering injustice. And she wanted to read me one of her poems, and I will read it for you, or for her, I guess, <laughs> called Poem About My Rights. Even tonight, I need to take a walk and clear my head about this poem, about why I can't go out without changing my clothes, my shoes, my body posture, my gender identity, my age, my status as a woman alone in the evening, alone on the streets, alone not being the point, the point being that I can't do what I want to do with my own body because I am the wrong sex, the wrong age, the wrong skin, and suppose it was not here in the city, but down on the beach or far into the woods, and I wanted to go there by myself, thinking about God, or thinking about children, or thinking about the world, all of it disclosed by the stars and the silence. I could not go, and I could not think, and I could not stay there alone. Now it was my turn to be angry. I said, you are making women into victims. And I recited one of my poems. Let her to be, let her to be, let her to be, let her try. Let it, let it be, let it be, let her be, let her be, let her be. Let her, let her, let her, let her try. Let her try. Let her be shy. Let her to be, let her to be, let her to be. Let her try, let her try. Let her, let her, let her, let her, let her, let her try. If you make people into victims, they may stop trying. You know, I walk constantly, and I walk wherever I want to walk, whenever I want to walk. Nobody sets my life up to me, and, and I will not blame anybody for setting my life, life up to me. I set my life up for myself. And she said, well, clearly I didn't perhaps understand being a woman. 
she mentioned that she had been raped twice, and she had an understanding of what kind of threat that women sometimes felt they were under. And I said, all I know is that I'm not going to be a victim to my gender. My gender is not going to keep me from accomplishing the things I want to accomplish, and I don't believe it's going to keep you, June Jordan, from doing that either. And I know for a fact that it did not keep her from doing what she needed to do. So then she started making noise about needing to move on, and I said, well, I need to go too, because I'm getting ready to move to Paris, and I'll take my little dog with me. <laughs> uh, However, I've enjoyed this conversation. And if you are ever in Paris, you look me up. My name is Gertrude Stein. You just ask. They will know where I am. Well, it's really hard being a genius. <laughs> you have to sit around doing nothing so much of the time. I mean, really doing nothing. <laughs> Seems to be easier to do that in Paris for some reason. Alice, are you going to get the door? Guess who it was? <laughs> June Jordan. I can't believe it. Surely. Here, have a seat. Surely you did not come all this way just to see me. And she assured me that no, she did not come all this way just to see me. That she was here in Paris to accept an award from Buckminster, no, not from Buckminster, an award for work that she had done as an architect with Buckminster Fuller. I believe it was a project that they had done to improve the living conditions in Harlem. And I said that was impressive because it is impressive. And apparently now she was an architect. Before she'd been a poet and a protester, and I think she had called herself a prophet at one point. Now she was an architect. And I said, apparently you have still not found your one absorbing occupation. She didn't care for that comment. She assured me that she had found her occupation, and it was to work against injustice and racism in the world, and that her work with Buckminster Fuller was part of that, and a variety of projects that she had going at the present time was part of that. And that was, from her point of view, her one absorbing occupation. And her motivation for that was her background and her life. And she read me one poem that kind of reflected the beginning of those feelings. It's called, Who Look at Me? And it's dedicated to her son, Christopher. So she was a mother as well. Who would paint a people black or white? For my own I have held where nothing showed me how, for finally I left alone to trace another destination. A white stare splits the air by blindness on the subway in department stores. The elevator, that unswerving ride where man ignores the brother by his side. A white stare splits, obliterates the nerve-wrung wrist from work the breaking ankle or the turning glory of a spine. Is that how we look to you, a partial nothing clearly real? Who see a solid clarity of feature, size and shape of someone's head, an unmistaken nose, the fact of afternoon as darkening his candle eyes, older men with swollen neck when they finally sit down, who will stand up for them? I cannot remember nor imagine pretty. People treat me like a double-jointed stick. Who look at me? Who see? And she said she was going to change that. And although I appreciated the poem... And I recognized her as a very talented writer. It concerns me when poets focus on the results of their poetry, on their identity, and on the audience, because I think the richest rewards for the reader come when the writer is writing without consideration of the audience. 
I think as writers, we need to focus on the process of discovery, on the creation that happens between the pen and the paper, or if you're a painter, between the brush and the canvas, not on some pre-thought-out result that you want to accomplish, or on identity, or for that matter, in my case, on the editing afterwards, but on that act of creation. I think anyone who writes, and I'm sure June would be aware of that too, when you think you're working on a masterpiece, you feel it happening, you are not aware of time, of your identity, or of your audience. And that's what masterpieces are made of. And again, she said, that her, she was going to use her talents and her skills to fight the injustice, to fight the racism that she saw in the world, and to help make lives better for people. And that was how she was going to use her poetic skills, to change things in politics and government so that they were done differently and applied to all people. And I said, well, I'm talking about masterpieces, and you're talking about government and politics. Government and politics have nothing to do with masterpieces. They have only to do with identity, nothing to do with masterpieces. Art is its own entity. It has its own identity. Art is art is art. Art is not political. Art the art comes first. Well, art can and does change the world. But the art comes first, not the politics. Otherwise, what you end up with is propaganda or co something commercialized. And that, in my opinion, demeans art. And June, I am certain that that's not something you want to do. She disagreed, obviously. She said that she was making poet poetry noble by her cause not demeaning it. And that she was going to, and that poetry had to be political. Words, in her point of view, were political. You couldn't get around it. I tried to get around it in my writing, actually. <laughs> but nevertheless, I said, you know, to me, government and politics are the most boring thing on earth. And I know that you are, in addition to your other, other roles, you are a teacher and you have certain ideas that you teach and you think those are the only ideas and a lot of those ideas have to do with the relationship between human groups. But I think the most interesting thing is the relationship of the human being to himself. What is going on in the human mind at any point in time is a damn sight more exciting than whatever goes on in government and politics. Well, clearly we were, oh, she did say, she said, well, maybe I should be more concerned about politics because um, they, this was in the early 30s and Hitler seemed to be gaining strength in Germany and perhaps I should be concerned about that. Wasn't I concerned about that? And I, I said, as I had said to other people, that I felt like Germany, the Germans were not organized enough to win a war. And in addition to that, I also felt like Europe surely did not have the stomach uh, for another war, having just been through one. In fact, Alice and I drove a supply ambulance during World War I, and I saw the injured and the refugees that resulted from that, and I could not believe that anyone who had seen those kinds of things would have the stomach for another war. Of course, I turned out to be wrong. Uh, and about when it comes to politics, I often am wrong. It's not something that I'm that interested in, as I've already said. But I was right in when I told her that I did not think that if it came to that, that Alice and I would probably stay in France. Uh, we considered going over the border, border to Switzerland, but we did not do that because we were assured by our French friends that they would, be, they would take care of us. They would protect us. And so we moved to the south of France in our house there, and that's where we stayed throughout the war. The villagers there were very fond of us, and they did protect us. The French people protected most of us during that time. Three-fourths of the Jews in France survived the war with thanks to the French people. So I am very grateful to them. 
It was not an easy time. There were food shortages. There was fuel shortages. I was out chopping wood a good deal of the time or searching for wood for fuel. There were cannons going off around us all the time. In fact, and, even, and the Germans even took over our house a couple times. We had to stay upstairs and be quiet and make sure we didn't speak American English and spoke only French. And it was a, a scary time, but we survived. And even though the, the German Gestapos broke into our apartment in Paris and threatened to destroy some of those works, particularly Picasso seemed to aggravate them. But uh, again, our friends in the Vichy government intervened and saved those works of art, and I think the world should be indebted to them for that. Well, I don't know, perhaps I was boring June, but suddenly she started, she had a dinner engagement that she had to get to, and I said, oh, no, 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 I wanted us to, I was getting ready to walk over to Picasso's, and I wanted you to come with me because I wanted to see the look on his face when you told him that his art was just political. And she, she didn't fall for that. She said, no, no, she'd go on to her dinner, but said, well, that's lovely. My idea would have been more fun for me, anyway. Excuse me, excuse me, is this the streetcar to the City Lights bookstore? Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> uh, do you mind? Oh, my God. I have died and gone to hell. It's June Jordan again. <laughs> but we were civil to one another. She, she asked me what I was doing in San Francisco, and I told her that I had grown up in that area, and she told me that she had now settled in, in the Berkeley area. And I also told her that I had just been to Oakland and there was no there there. So I decided to go on to the City Lights bookstore and see, since it was the 70s, see if any writers had caught up with me, even though I knew the answer to that. And I also told her that the last time I was in America was in uh, 1934, 1935, and they put my name up in lights on Times Square. And newspapers all across the country had headlines in it like, Gertie, Gertie, Gertie is back, back, back. <laughs> and I, I said, now that's what can happen if you focus on your one absorbing occupation and are true to your craft. She informed me that she had been focusing on her one absorbing occupation, that she had continued to use her poetry to advance the causes of justice, peace, and against racism. And in fact, in Berkeley, she had started a program called, I believe, Poetry for the People that still exists today. And it was aimed primarily at the youth to not only familiarize them with poetry, but to get them, to free them to express themselves through poetry, their needs and their thoughts. And that was one of her goals now that she was deeply involved in. She called herself a warrior, a warrior against injustice and racism, as her father had taught her to be. And I said, well, I was a warrior too. I was a warrior for words. You know, it is a very difficult thing to have the courage to keep doing something when no one else thinks it is a serious thing. At least sometimes, they, I'm sure they thought that what June was doing was a serious thing, but they did not often feel that way about me. I was subject to a good deal of ridicule, and in fact, I, I carry some of my bad reviews with me just to remind me of how far I've come. <laughs> Let me share a couple. This one is about tender buttons that I mentioned earlier. It's from Detroit. After reading excerpts of it, a person feels like going out and pulling the dime bank building over onto himself. <laughs> uh, that was, that's funny now. It was not particularly funny then. You know, one of the best, maybe the best review that I got was in the Kansas City Star. 
Can you believe that? Not San Francisco, not New York, Kansas City, Missouri. I always regretted not getting to visit there. Uh, let me read you one more of the bad ones, though. There were more of those. This was by Wyndham Lewis, who had visited in my home in, in Paris. I was devastated by this one. The most wearisome dirge it is possible to imagine. A cold black suet pudding. A cold suet roll of fabulously reptilian length. Cut it at any point. It is the same thing. The same heavy, sticky, opaque mass. Now, don't you think it took courage to keep moving forward against that kind of opposition? Well, she said that, in a, and, I, and I, so I said I was a warrior, as she was, but my war involved language. You know, if language doesn't change, it dies, and if it dies, the society dies with it. So that was my cause. And she said in addition to being a warrior, though, she also was a, a great proponent of universal love and wanting people to have the ability to love whomever they wanted to love. And as an example of that, she read me this poem of hers, I'll read you the first part of it at least, about faces. Most people search all of their lives for some place to belong to, as you said, but I look instead into the eyes of anyone who talks to me. I search for a face to believe and belong to, a loosening mask with a voice, ears, and a consciousness breathing through a nose I can see. Day to day, it's the only way I like to travel, noticing the colors of a cheek, the curvature of a brow, and the public declarations of two lips. Those, those are the faces that interest me, the individual people and the ways that I can help them improve their lives. Well, again, those were noble causes, and I appreciated them. I do have a little trouble with the concept of universal love. It concerns me that maybe if you're loving everyone, it's difficult to love anyone. And, as I said earlier, I loved one woman for 36 years. I think people probably think Gertrude Stein doesn't know anything about love. But I want to read an excerpt from a short story I wrote that might contradict that. And this story is about Melanza, a young black woman who was in love with a young black man, or he was in love with her particularly. And he loved it, and he felt strong, the joy of all his being and it swelled out full inside him, and he poured it all out back to her in freedom, in tender kindness and in joy, and in gentle brother fondling. And she loved him for it always, and they loved it always more and more, together with this new feeling they had now in those long summer days so warm, more and more to each other always. And that's the kind of love that I relate to. And I told her that actually that, that story, which was part of my trilogy called Three Lives, was written 30 years before you were born. And it was about a mature relationship between a young black woman and a young black man. And I tried to capture the rhythm of their culture and the rhythm of their language in a respectful way. And I believe I succeeded, and a lot of people thought I did, in fact, Richard Wright, a black author that you would probably be familiar with, wrote this. All of my life, I had been only half hearing, but Miss Stein's struggling words made the speech of the people around me vivid. From that moment on, in my attempts at writing, I was able to tap at will into the vast pool of words that swirled around me. So we really, we were warriors, and we both had our own versions of love, I guess. And she was talking on about some of her causes and things that she was involved in in Berkeley, and, and suddenly the wind kind of tried to take my hat, and I said, oh, I've forgotten, I've forgotten how windy San Francisco can be. 
And I'm afraid I then said a good deal of the wind seems to be coming from that direction, but I don't, I don't think she heard me <laughs> happily. <laughs> and I showed her my hat. I said, this is the hat that I wore on my triumphant return to America. People called it my Robin Hood hat. Would you like to hold it? She said no. She was not interested in holding it, and I didn't think she would be. But, uh, <laughs> and then she started saying, oh, 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 there's the bookstore. It's your stop. You need to get off. You'll have to walk back. And I said, oh, I don't mind walking. She said, no, 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 no. It's time for you to get off. <laughs> and so I took the hint, and I went on to the bookstore. This is the bookstore. <laughs> ah. So I'm here looking through these books that I've located in the bookstore. And who walks in? June Jordan. <laughs> but she's carrying my hat, and I was impressed by that, because that meant she had to walk all the way back that she was trying to save me just to bring me back my hat. And I said, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for that because I really would have missed that hat. It's part of my persona now, and my persona is very important to me. <laughs> and then I told her I had found some kind of interesting things here at the bookstore. This one book I was just looking at had a peculiar name, Howell. <laughs> and this fellow, Allen Ginsberg, do you know Allen Ginsberg, I asked? And she said, well, of course. <laughs> We're both here in Berkeley. And we've both been censored. And I said, well, did we have that in common? Because I guess you could say I was censored. Nobody would publish me. I suppose that's a form of censorship. So we do have that in common. And I hadn't read much of the poetry, but there was a, a phrase here at the very front that caught my attention. Unscrew the locks from the doors. Unscrew the doors themselves from their jams. I said, that's what I was trying to do with language. June said, that's what I was trying to do for people. We have two things in common. Progress is being made. <laughs> and I showed her this other book here that I came upon, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, asked her if she knew about anything about him. And she said that he was one of the founders of the City Lights bookstore and had defended, in fact, Allen Ginsberg against censorship. So he was someone that I intend to read some more of. That was kind of interesting. Then I couldn't resist showing her, however, this book that I had found prominently displayed, Gertrude Stein. <laughs> they even had postcards of me there. I asked her if she wanted to take a look at it. Surprisingly, she said yes. So she took a look at that, and then I had to admit I had also found, a little further back on the shelf, uh, June Jordan, <laughs> Naming Our Destiny. And I'd found a couple of poems in there that I rather liked. There was one I particularly wanted to read to her because I wanted to see if she could tell me who it reminded me of. So I will read it to you. It's uh, from Tape Testimony of a Bernard Getz. I was sitting down, and it happened to me, but before that I was sitting down or I was standing up and I was by myself because, of course, a lot of the time I am by myself because I am not married or famous or super important enough to have shadows or bodyguards, so I was alone as it happens when I was sitting down, or, or let me retract that, I wasn't with anybody else, regardless who else was there, and I know I am not blind, I could see other people around me, but, but the point is that I wasn't with them. I wasn't with anybody else. Like I said, it happened before two or three times it had happened that I was sitting down or I was standing up when one of them, or one time it was more than one, I think it was it was two of them. Anyway, they just jumped on me. I mean, they jumped on me like I was chump change, and I know I am not blind. I could see they were laughing at me. They thought it was funny. And I said, does that remind you of anybody? And she had this blank look on her face, much like some I see out there. And I said, it sounds like Gertrude Stein to me. It sounds like June Jordan has discovered how people actually talk. And I thought I was quite impressed by that. And she said, to my surprise, that she found a poem of mine that she liked. So since she's not here to read it, I will read that to you. It's called Let Us Describe. Let us describe how they went 
It was a very windy night, and the road, although in excellent condition and extremely well graded, has many turnings, and although the curves are not sharp, the rise is considerable. It was a very windy night, and some of the larger vehicles found it more prudent not to venture. In consequence, some of those who planned to go were unable to do so. Many others did go, and there was a sacrifice. Of what shall we? A sheep, a hen, a cock, a village, a ruin, and all that, and then that having been blessed, let us bless it. It was a very sad time in our village. And having been blessed, it has continued to be blessed in the continuous present. <sighs> but there was one other poem of hers that I wanted to draw attention to because I was so impressed by the imagery and the sound, and sound is so important to me. I'll read you the first part of it. It was a poem for South African women, commemoration of the 40,000 women and children who in 1956 presented themselves in bodily protest against apartheid, which was another of her causes. She visited there as well as Angola and was read before the United Nations. Our own shadows disappear as the feet of thousands by tens of thousands pound the fallow land into new dust that rising like a marvelous pollen will be fertile even as the first woman whispering imagination to the trees around her made for righteous fruit from such deliberate defense of life as no other still will claim inferior to any other safety in the world. The whispers, too, they intimate to the inmost ear of every spirit. Now arouse they, carousing in ferocious affirmation of all peaceable and loving amplitude, sound a certainly unbounded heat from a baptismal smoke where, yes, there will be fire. I love that line. I love that line. That was a, an excellent poem, June. We were getting along pretty well, for a change. <laughs> and I noticed this box that said, Free Poetry. And I said, oh, that's what I'm trying to do, free poetry. And, but she explained to me that, no, that was just, they had at the City Lights Bookstore, I guess they allowed poets to exhibit their works, so they're trying to get attention to themselves and to give away their poetry if they wanted to. And so I said, let's see what's in here. And I did find, well, there were... Uh, There actually should be two, <laughs> one by Kellyanne Pearson and one by Sharon Gibson, when they only have one. But we commented we hadn't heard of either one, actually, so um, we were looking at them and discovered that each of them had poems in here, one about June and one about Gertrude. And I said, isn't that wonderful? They are continuing the conversation with us. And it reminded me of something that I had just found out, and that is in, in 1976, and we're here in the 70s, that... Uh, Leonard Bernstein had, had put out a recording called Song Fest, and it had a number of poets on it, not that many poets, but it did have two, June Jordan and Gertrude Stein. So something else we had in common. And there, something else again. Now, I, unfortunately, I cannot read, re read you the tribute to June, but I can read, read you what Sharon Gibson wrote about Gertrude. She titled it, for Gertrude with Love. I'm sure she knew I could not resist reading <laughs> something with that title. If you ask me, I will tell you. She walked the way she wrote. She wrote the way she walked, and she loved walking like she loved writing. She was always loving what she wrote. She spent slightly more time loving writing than she did loving walking. She spent a lot of time walking since when she was walking, every step was the same. Because when she was walking, every step was seeming different. When she was writing, every word is always seeming the same. Every word was always seeming different. Over and over, they are seeming the same. Over and over, they are seeming different. She was loving all of them. 
and she loved all of it. If you could ask her, would she tell you? Would she tell you if you could ask her? <laughs> well, I don't know the answer to that. Sometimes I don't even know the question. <laughs> but um, I did love all of it. And I loved the conversation that I had just had with June Jordan. However, America, even though America is my country, Paris is still my hometown. And besides that, there's a cemetery there with my name in it. And uh, Alice is getting lonely, I suppose. So I said, June, there's one thing I have to say. That's all I can say. Goodbye, June Jordan. Oh, it's good to be home, back in Paris. And I have something to say. Does that surprise you? <laughs> no, <laughs> doesn't surprise me either. I do like to talk, although I like to listen quite a bit too. And sometimes people actually listen to me. <clears throat> the first thing I want to say is that I will never agree with June Jordan. Art and poetry cannot have as its primary function politics. Art and poetry have a much higher calling. Art is art is art. It is an entity unto itself. It stands alone, just as a rose is a rose is a rose. But there's another aspect to this story that I would like to emphasize just as much, and that is that Gertrude and June were the same. All of us are the same, and sometimes we forget that. We have little variations, and I've written about the bottom nature differences in people. But over the centuries, all human beings are the same. The only thing that makes us different is the things, what we are looking at, what surrounds us. And sometimes that's as simple as geography or weather. In our case, maybe it was more complex. I was in Paris in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and I was looking at the artists that were changing the world, and that became my focus. June Jordan was looking at the United States in the 50s and 60s and 70s and on, and she saw the racism and injustice, and that became her focus. But we were the same, especially because we were both pioneering. And I have always said that pioneering means that you have to tear down what was built before you. I was trying to tear off the shackles that had been around words and language and literature for centuries. June was trying to tear off the shackles around people that society and culture had put there. We were the same. You know, which of us had the harder job, I don't know. You'll have to decide that. Which of us was more successful, I, you'll have to decide that. I suppose it depends on whether literature changed the most or society changed the most. But the important thing is that we were basically the same. Now, June will say that I had the easier life. And she's probably right. I mean, she was middle class, but I was definitely upper middle, upper, probably upper class. And as I said earlier, I wanted for nothing as a child, and I've been taken care of all of my life. My parents took well, good care of me, and when they died, my brother Michael and brothers Michael and Leo took over, took excellent care of me, steered me in the right direction. And when Leo ultimately got tired of that relationship, or I did, whichever, uh, Alice B. Toklas took care of me for the rest of my life. Am I sorry? Am I sorry that I was taken care of all my life? No. No. Everyone should have that opportunity. It allowed me to focus on my one absorbing occupation and to try to accomplish those things that I needed to accomplish. So I'm not sorry. In fact, I'm very proud of my life. You know, some people call me a 19th century writer because I was born in the 19th century. Other people will call me a 20th century writer because I wrote mostly in the 20th century. Personally, I would say I was at least a 21st century writer. <laughs> and there's something I want all of you to know, 
and I wish June were here because I want her to know it too. When the 22nd century arrives, I will still be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Oh, well, good. On the fly, right? <laughs> this lady here is awesome. You guys are lucky to have her, believe me. Come up and meet Karen Gibson. She has some poetry for you guys. Yes, I do. I'll just pass my little booklet out. Oh, I don't care. I kind of like how it. All right. <laughs> I can't be heard otherwise. I don't know if I have enough here, but see what. I wish I had the others as well.